research to solve their issues and their challenges for all in New Zealand. So uh, the example there, right in the middle of the diagram, is the National Science Challenges. And then the funds are arranged according to who makes the decision and how we decide what the research projects that are going to be funded. So the ones at the top are the ones where the funding is devolved to institutes to make that decision about what is the science projects. So the big EMB one up there in the big dark circle um, is the strategic science investment one. And the ones down the bottom, these are the ones that are allocated through a full length competitive process. So you'll see down there the second one and the left is the endeavour fund, which is what we're here today to talk about. Fund that's fully competitive and is really going to develop impacts and uh, outcomes for New Zealand. So uh, that's all I wanted to cover. So now I'm going to hand over to Eric and he'll talk you through the Endeavour Fund. So Eric. Uh, good morning. So I'm going to give a bit of a wrap up on the 2019 um, Endeavour Round. of the actual success rates, um, you can see that in 2019 we were 49 um, smart ideas proposed under about 283, so the success rate was about 70 percent but over. And the research programs were 22 funded out of the 139 that were um, submitted, so the success rate was about um, 70 percent. So overall, the success rate for Endeavour in 2019 was 70. Um, you can see that the amount of money is increasing in smart ideas and it has dropped a little bit in research programs. And so the reason for that is that the policy objectives is to have 20% of the funding from the debt going to smart ideas and that's slowly moving in that direction. So a few quick observations. Um, we, need to, we were really pleased that quality of applications continue to grow. <coughs> was really um, good in 2019 round. So because the application quality keeps on going up, if you submit an application, it should be aware that if you submit an application one year and you're unsuccessful, you come back the second year and resubmit it, you may not get the same um, quintile rating of your proposal because there's been other proposals submitted that were viewed more highly. Uh, it is a competitive process. Um, the Science Board used the portfolio approach that was new in the Gazette notice, and Max will talk more about that. Um, what was really um, pleasing to EMB was that the number of proposals that were funded in the society space, so these, um, there was 9%, and so that had an effect on the overall portfolio funded, and I'll come back to that. Uh, the, science, the science proposals continued to grow, and um, there are consequences of that. And part of the portfolio approach, which Max will talk about, um, was that the value of the largest proposals is considered by the science board when they're making their funding decisions. And one of the large proposals, very large proposals that were submitted, did not receive funding. Um, in terms of transform and um, protecting that value, about 40% of transform and 40% of the protecting that value were funded, which was great. Um, and yeah, so that was good, but we were really pleased about that. So just talking a bit more about the transform, because that was new in 2019, a lot of people have been asking questions about that. And so just as a reminder, here is um, a piece out of the Z notice. 
proposals, um, the researchers come up with radical change, but it doesn't result in the transformational change and the ultimate impact, so it will not succeed in that category. So um, we've been asked by a number of people um, how did it go and give some examples so they can better understand what is required in terms of transformational proposal. So of the 22 research programs that were funded, eight met the criteria, uh, eight were transformational What we're doing is putting these. So, if you look at the individual web page, there's a list of successful pro proposals, the institute, and as part of it, if you go further into the endeavour page, there is a summary table with clear um, public statements. So, what we at the request of people at the first roadshow um, was to annotate those tables so people understand. And as far as I know, they'll have an asterisk for the transform proposal explained in it.
Drew talked about getting the diversity data of our payment accounts and assessors, and so we just started that analysis, and you can see that um, the science leaders in our affiliation on the research programs in 2019 was about 6.5%. to what's going to happen in 2020. But before I do that, um, I'd like to outline what the sweet spot is for Endeavour so you can look uh, and see if this is uh, a fund that would suit your research. So the sweet spot for Endeavour is high science stretch. And by that we mean um, things like world-leading science, science that will have an impact on the discipline, science that is on the cutting edge. So we want that really high stretchy science now, because the science is stretchy, um, there will be risk. So what we want is that risk to be well identified and managed. And then if it works, we want it to transform New Zealand. So the sweet spot for Endeavour is high science stretch that's well managed, that if it works, will transform New Zealand. So that's um, where Endeavour is focused. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at uh, what's the difference in 2020, and the good news is that not much at all. So um, it's pretty much business as usual, it's going to be the same as last year, um, with only a few minor changes. Now, um, I would encourage you to read the Gazette notice and the call for proposals. And sure, they're written in government speak, um, but all the rules that we follow, all the criteria we use, all the things we're looking for are explicitly written in that document. So before you start any of your writing, go and have a look at that and see how your um, proposal fits in. Okay, so how much are we investing? We're investing uh, 56.8 million, 18 million for smart ideas, and 38.8 million research programs. For those of you with sharp eye, you'll notice that this is about $1.2 million less than last year. And the reason for that is that we have to manage the money that the government gives us. <coughs> as applicants are putting la longer and longer time bids in, the more it locks up money for a long period of time. And so to compensate for that, um, we just um, have decreased it slightly so that we have money for all the out years going on. Uh, the important thing to notice is that the target for the split in research programs between protect and add value and transform is now moving up over time and it's 60% in protect and add value and 40% in that transform category. Okay, so let's talk about the investment mechanisms. There is two investment mechanisms within the Endeavour Fund. The first one is smart ideas and the function of smart ideas is to bring the flush of new ideas into the science system. The premium on smart ideas is how good is the idea. It's there for proof of concept, it's there for initial looks at exciting uh, new areas. You can have them for two or three years and between 400k and a million dollars. Don't put one in for 300k or 1.2 million because you will be judged ineligible and get knocked out. So make sure it's between those. Research programs are for those larger, uh, more established research teams who are attacking some of New Zealand's really gnarly problems or who are creating opportunities for New Zealand. So they can be three, four, five years and a minimum of 500k up to there is no limit on the size that you can apply for. Uh, if we start to delve into smart ideas, you submit a concept, the concepts get judged for excellence, and then if you're in uh, above what the science board is looking for, you'll get invited to submit a full proposal. 
it's important to look at where the weighting is on the four different criteria. So there's four criteria. How good is the science? Have you got New Zealand's best team? Uh, what are going to be the benefits to New Zealand? And show us how it's going to get used. Those are the sort of four categories. Uh, the biggest weighting in smart ideas is science. So it's really on the quality of the idea. Now here are the deadlines for smart ideas. So the one that's uh, very important is registration. If you don't register, you cannot submit a concept application. So um, make sure that by 6th of November, you've got your registrations in, because if you haven't registered, um, uh, you won't be able to put in your concept. Uh, concepts are due 27th of November and 27th of May. Let's talk about research uh, programs. These are submitted uh, just simply. There's only one application, but it's assessed in two different stages. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, soon. What you'll notice here is that the weightings on the four criteria are equal. And um, if you're in research programs, it's not only how you meet the criteria, but the science board then looks at the portfolio approach into in a bit of detail. Again, here are the closing dates for submission for research programs. Again, uh, you have to register, so make sure you register so you don't miss out on the opportunity to put in your proposal. Registrations are 11th of December 2019, and the closing dates for proposal are 4th of March 2020. One of the important aspects about the Endeavour Fund is uh, Vishu Matauranga. So um, just to remind you um, about that, have a look at our Vishu Matauranga policy. And the policy is, is split into those four areas, um, enhancing productivity and performance, sustainability, health and social well-being, and generating new knowledge at the interface. So um, that's another important now about the assessment and decision making uh, process. There is a large number of uh, urban legends and rumours we hear and it's a black box and, and we don't know what the science board does. So this year we've decided to tell you exactly what the science board does uh, when they make their decision so everybody can, can see what happens. Okay, um, also to note that um, how the science board operate and the rules that the science board follow to make their decisions in the portfolio approach. That's written in the Gazette Notice. So if you want to see it all in black and white, uh, read the Gazette Notice. Let's talk about Smart Ideas. So in Smart Ideas you submit a concept. Uh, it is assessed for excellence. So we have, it goes out to four excellence assessors. And then one of those assessors is the lead assessor. They summarise what the um, others have said. So what the science board have requested is that the lead assessor is not saying, oh, there's three of those like it and one of those don't, so the overall average opinion is that it's, that, that it's good. What the science board has requested is in those lead assessment summaries that each of the four individual assessments are summarised so the science board can see um, the variety of opinions that have come through on a particular application. Then a ranked order list is assembled based on the median score, not the mean score. And the reason we've gone with the median score is that sometimes you might get a rogue assessor who is wildly different to the others. So if we take the mean, it uh, minimises the effect of that. And um, so it's quite useful for applicants. Then the science board makes a decision as to where the science quality is at and decides how many will go through to a full um, proposal. Applicants uh, who meet that mark are then invited to submit a full proposal. Now, uh, a full proposal comes in, it's reassessed for excellence and also for impact. So we have four excellence assessors and four uh, impact assessors. Uh, now, the thing to realise is that the reason we reassess the excellence is in the concept you've got minimal space to outline your science. When you get the full proposal, we want the excellence assessors to, to in effect, um, assess the whole thing.
things um, with more details in the full proposal. Uh, it's better that way. Uh, a lot of people ask, is it going to be the same for assessors that have my, assessed my concept that are assessing my full proposal? And the answer to that is, it might be, it might not be. And the reason for that is that some assessors say, I'm available for concepts, I'm not available for full proposals. Um, with more detail that we now have in the full proposals, we may be able to um, look at matching uh, and with a lot more um, accuracy around the expertise. So it might be the same, it might be different. So for excellence assessments, for impact assessments, then it goes into um, a ranked order list based on combining them according to the weightings and the medians, and then that goes up to the science board to make their cut-off decision as to which uh, smart ideas they would like to fund. Okay, research programs, uh, slightly different. You submit your for full proposal um, at the beginning. They're all assessed for excellence, exactly the same as smart ideas. Uh, you get a ranked order list. The science board looks at the quality of the science and then it makes a cut off and decides which applications are going through to impact assessment. Then for impact assessment, we then send it out to four um, assessors, four impact assessors. We used to use a panel, we're not using a panel now, we just go out with four uh, impact assessors. And uh, the lead assessor uh, provides a summary, um, they may revise a score if they um, see, see it's warranted, and then the science board looks at that. Now the scores you get are one input to the science board's decision making. The science board on top of um, considering all the scores you get uses the portfolio approach to make the final decision. And we'll go uh, into what's involved in the portfolio approach. Um, so here's a bit of a summary. Smart ideas, it's a ranked order list based on the scores you get, merit, and the science board is making a decision there. Uh, but for research programs, they're um, considering the portfolio targets, they're considering the impact categories, transforming, So what is this uh, portfolio approach that the Science Board uh, makes? So the first thing they consider is, are the proposals of sufficient merit? And these are really your scores. Are the scores good enough to um, achieve funding? So hence the scores you get are very important. Then they consider the overall mix of investments within the portfolio, and not just the portfolio of the round, but the whole portfolio of current investments and how these meet the um, investment signals that are in the investment plan. I'll go through and show you what the investment signals are. Then they consider the value offered by the largest proposals. So they're, they're looking at in specifically at the large proposals. And the general rule is the bigger it is, the more scrutiny it gets. Uh, they're looking to see if uh, they are avoiding duplication or an, or an excessive concentration in one part of the portfolio, and then they're applying the general policy objectives, which includes where, where appropriate uh, vision marked over on. So uh, here are the signals within the investment plan. Uh, there are four general signals, and there are two specific signals. Now the general signal is excellent research with high impact in areas of future value, growth, and critical New Zealand. So it's got to have great excellence and impact. The second signal is it wants to leverage wider investment and knowledge in New Zealand and overseas. So this is really important. This is about putting your research in context. Here's where the state of the field is. Here's where um, the state of development is. I'm doing this new bit. So you should approach that so that it's very clear to them they can see that you're well tapped in, that you know what's going on. You may want to, um, certainly in informing New Zealand's best teams, be very aware of what's happening in New Zealand. You may want to connect into um, skill bases and things offshore, which are worldly and for the work you're doing. Signal three uh, is give effect to Vision Mar which is a specific consideration. 
and uh, G4. G4 was one that wasn't particularly well done last year, which is to take account of broader government and policy, uh, government policy and strategy documents. So this is an easy win because how um, better to show relevance and importance to New Zealand by saying, well, actually, there's this government strategy that wants New Zealand to achieve this. Um, my research ties into that bit and that bit, and it automatically shows that, yes, you're doing something that um, the government thinks is important for New Zealand. So don't forget to consider um, simple form. We have uh, two signals which the uh, government is particularly interested in. The first is creating and growing knowledge-intensive industries. Now, you may be wondering what a knowledge-intensive industry is. So go to the investment plan. There's a definition of it there. But it's um, things, industries that are going to create high value jobs, they're industries that are based on intellectual property, um, those sorts of things that you would view as a sort of um, very knowledge intensive in terms of the way industries work. The second one is supporting transition to a low emissions economy. So when you see that thing, you think, um, wow, there's a whole lot of research that could come under that banner um, because uh, there is a lot of things that so it looks like a very broad signal, but it's actually a very narrow signal, because if you read the details of it, they're after economic benefit related to the transition to a low emissions economy. That means that um, it cannot be in the economic or, uh, sorry, in the environmental or the societal outcome areas. There must be an economic benefit associated with doing it, and it must be focused on greenhouse gas emissions. So it's actually kind of narrow. So uh, have a look at the definition um, with that one. Now let's talk about the large proposals. The largest proposal that came into us last year was for $21 million. Now that's a significant amount of money. It's getting up towards the size of the National Science Journal. So the Science Board um, has to consider the value of these large proposals. So I'll start off by saying what it's not. It is not the value for money of a particular proposal. So value for money means I'm getting these benefits, it costs me this amount to do the research, one divided by the other is value for money. It's not that. What the science board is looking at is it's looking at, at the portfolio level. It's saying um, I've got all these options to invest in, they're all good science and merit. Um, I could invest in this huge one, which would take away most of my money, or I could invest in these four other ones, um, which would uh, fill gaps in my portfolio and deliver a broader spectrum of benefits. So that's what they're trading off in value for money. And they specifically do that by looking at the um, highest rating ones. So um, what everybody will be thinking of, well, what's a large proposal? What do I need to squeak under to not be considered large? Um, but there is no rule, there is no magic number. What we do is we simply highlight the largest proposals to the science board. Um, so the overall message is, if you're large, you'll get more scrutiny, and if you're large, you need to be of the very highest quality to get through. So in terms of the largest proposals that we had um, in the 219 round, one was exceptional quality across the board and got through. Um, one offered less, less value across the portfolio, so it was rejected on that basis. Uh, let's talk about concentration and duplication. So that's another thing that the Science Board considers. So it looks at what's in its current investments and it says how much have we got um, in each area. This is what's come in this year. Have we got too much over here and not enough over there? Uh, they also look for duplication, which is proposals doing uh, the same sorts of research um, and they also try to avoid that as well. Duplication to me is not a big area we see within the portfolio, um, but um, they do have a, a look at concentration. So uh, it raises the question of well, how does the science board know which all these research, my research program, which area is it in? And the answer is they don't guess, you tell us. So when you fill in your answering codes, your um, part of that is declaring uh, which particular areas you're in. So pay attention to that and get it as accurate as possible so that you have um, the most accurate information about your proposal to, to the science board. So let's
Let's talk about uh, transform in the, as Eric explained, in the 219 round. The target was to have 30% of the portfolio in research programs in transform. Um, we, we sort of held our breath and waited to see how that would go in 219, but we were extremely pleasantly surprised to see that 35% of the um, proposals we got in were in this transform area. And um, once you got past science excellence into that impact round, 43% um, got investment. So um, coming up with a, a transform idea that will be radical for a sector and then transform New Zealand outcomes for New Zealanders is pretty hard. So I think the applicant community has responded to this really well and we're really encouraged by the, the vibrancy and the amount of transformative ideas that we're getting in. So please keep those coming. In the 2020 round, you'll see that we've moved the target for transform up to 40%, and um, the year after, in 2021, the target goes to 50%. So this really ties into the endeavors sweet spot. We want great science, high impact, uh, well-managed, and transform New Zealand. Okay, so um, I'll pass back to Eric, who will give you some uh, top secret tips on how to write a good proposal. I'll just sit down a couple of minutes. <laughs> right. So there's just a few things to consider when um, applying to the endeavour and thinking about um, what how can you get a better proposal. So the, the first one's about thinking about what's going to come out of the proposal. So Quite a few people, good researchers, good scientists, they know their science really well, and when they put their proposal, they succeed in excellence, good team, good science, and it falters on the um, impact assessment because they haven't thought about what the impact outcomes of the research will be. So the suggestion is think of what, what is going to happen as a result of the research and work backwards. Um, in terms, Max has mentioned the sweet spot for endeavour being stretchy science that will generate good impact and it's well managed. So that's what the next two things are about. So it's really important you point out, talk about stretch in the proposal and the thinking behind it and um, make sure there's, you know, there's four assessors with these larger multidisciplinary projects, there will be assessors that different um, speciality topics. So make sure when you are writing your proposal, you write to a more, a, not at a technical jargon level, because you're going to lose some of the assessors along the way. So it's really important that you show that, but use good English, or simple English, and talk about how the risk can be managed. So that's talking about, this is what we want to do. If um, you know, there's research programs in five years, as you're doing the proposals, things may change, and things so talk about, well, if this doesn't work, we can try this, this, and this. Um, we <coughs> encourage you to get the best team. Um, we, that all comes down to having the best science, doing stretch and science with the best people. And um, this includes the end users. Um, so depending on what you're doing, there might be people that can add value in the implementation part. 
students and postdocs, and so talk about a broader benefit to New Zealand um, against the paper and development economy. Um, Co-design co with end users, it's about, it comes back to the first thing, thinking about the end in mind and doing it early. Um, if people, from my experience when I was a business manager, people don't want to be given the thing on a plate at the end and say, sign this, we're putting it in tomorrow. It doesn't really work. Um, you need to talk about them and take them on the journey with you. And um, it doesn't matter whether it's a business or a Maori group or whoever, you, it's, it shows respect to them that you build them in early and talk to them and take them on the journey and you end up with something designed together. And the last one comes back to aligning the board and government uh, strategies and policies. That's the investment signal G4. So if you're going to do work that has could have policy implications, um, it's prudent to have a, engage with that government department and find out what they want and make sure your work actually relates to them. You're not just going to do it and dump it and hope somebody picks it up. Um, so it's a good way of demonstrating what happens. And that is what the general signal for. So there are policies and a lot of things as Max said. So in terms of the traditional Mataranga, a uh, few thoughts here. Um, the first one is about um, giving consider good consideration of the relevance of the proposal um, under each criteria. So the, there are four criteria, science, team, being to use on the implementation pathway. And so in some work from fundamental high energy physics, for example, it doesn't may not see it has an immediate connection with um, traditional Mataranga. But there's the team, you could have Māori um, students or postdocs on the team, just researchers. The benefit to New Zealand, um, come, back, come back to that, the implementation pathway, there may be engagement there. And the benefit to New Zealand is that um, line of sight, long distance view, what this work could do. And some of that may engage with Māori um, partners. And so it's really important, particularly with some of these more basic things, to think of them in a broader way. And that might help you explain it. So the thing to remember and a few proposals in uh, 2019 created um is not probably the right word. You have a you have a place where you can say whether the proposal is relevant to the end or not. It's yes or no. There's a box under that. So then you can explain why you know you talk to some Maori uh, EMU groups or whoever and say it's not relevant. Or you can explain why it is relevant to what they're doing. The difficulty is, and it's not unique, it happens a few times, and you say it's not relevant, and then you explain your engagement with Maori Iwi, and it's sort of like, you took the wrong box, do you not understand the question? It is, really makes it hard for reviewers to understand what you're doing, so think about that. Um, the point about engaging with Maori at the beginning, not the end, it's the first place. Um, South Devil. <laughs> um, the thought about, about the having a statement at the beginning, it's about helping the reader, the assessor, to understand where this proposal is going. So if you put it at the front and high early on, then people know what you're trying to do. If you're going to put in a transform proposal, talk about why it's transformational. If, you, if the end is relevant, talk about how it, it's going to do it. So the reader, as they move through the proposal, they know what you're trying to talk about and where you're a sort of a signpost and direction. You put it on page 56, they may miss it. And that's not what you want. Um, and then the, considering Murray involvement of the wider project team, it's, um, it's some of those end users, but realize that they have, um, it's respectful and it helps get better engagement if you're willing to pay the cost to build them into the um, proposal budget. It's, it's something we will more than happily cover. So just the last few things to say. A uh, few little things. Uh, again, remember to have informative titles, these long tabloid ones. They puns are quite fun in a way, but they're not useful in the real process. So you can avoid them, right, don't avoid them, don't use them, we will be more happy. In terms of the executive summary, it's the go-to place in the um, proposal. That's where people understand what's going on and get a first um, introduction to it. By using the uh, subtitles for the assessment criteria, it helps people understand this is what the science about, this is the team, this is the benefit of using the implementation pathway. Um, you don't have a lot of words, so use them wisely, but by splitting them into those four categories really makes it easier for people to read. And um, the executive summary is one of the um, parts of the application that goes to the science board and the, uh, um, for making their decisions. So it's uh, something easy to refer to and understand what it's about. Um, public statements, those
things come in when the proposal is submitted, and when you have the successful ones, those go out. Um, the media sees them, um, the minister's office gets them, everybody sees them, and so you want to make sure they're written well and easy to understand and digest and understand the project. And um, so they need to be concise, precise, and good jargon. Um, make the outcomes and benefits clear, perhaps put some of that at the beginning rather than Sam Holmes, uh, and I'm working the science policy team at MB. So um, hopefully I can um, take your attention for a few more minutes. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about some thinking we've been doing on the impact of research. And um, I'll keep it fairly brief. Um, we have some, some flyers here which I'll leave at the front. Um, there's a paper on the website and please come and talk to me afterwards um, if you want to know more. So, um, this is um, broader than endeavour. We're thinking about impact across the whole of the science funding system. Um, and we're thinking about um, really how to um, articulate what impact um, the system as a whole is having. And we, we want to try and um, set some clearer definitions and expectations for the sector around that. So this follows on from some consultation we did back in 2017. And we've taken on board um, the feedback we, we got then. Um, so we're not formally consulting on this paper, but we are keen to keep uh, working with the sector um, and to tweak this approach so that it works for everyone. So um, how did we get here? Um, so people have been talking about the impact of research for, for a long time, in fact. Um, but um, one of the most recent um, times it was introduced in, in New Zealand was back in science investment, so that introduced these dual uh, pillars of um, excellence and impact as part of the high performing science system. And it said um, all the, all the public, public, publicly funded research should have a strong line of sight to impact, so we're trying to unpack what that actually means in practice. Um, other things that have happened, so the PBRF round in 2018 for the first time had a, uh, the option to put in um, a statement around and impact as um, a type of research contribution for the first time. We were probably um, aware of that. And um, another thing that's happening is there's a this rising tide of research investment. So the, the government's committed to um, target and promote economy-wide R&D spending to 2% of GDP over 10 years. It's currently at about 1.4%. And GDP is growing, so that's actually quite a challenge. And so part of justifying um, that expenditure is, is going to be telling the story of the impact that that, that investment will have for, for New Zealand. And for those broader well-being goals, um, which Bryn mentioned earlier. <coughs> the other thing is um, this thing called NRIS. It's a certain so name I've heard of it. So it's a database which MB is building um, with other funders in the sector. Um, and it's for the first time it's going to bring together all of our um, science funding contracts across government in one place. So that's a useful backbone for this um, sort of impact data. 
So, um, as I said, so there's several reasons to do this. Um, beyond the, you know, justifying that uh, continued investment towards the two percent target, um, and that's not a that's not a trivial thing. So, just because the government set a target doesn't mean it will happen. There's other competing priorities. So, there's these um, very ambitious child poverty targets, for example. There's a transition to a low emissions economy. All of these things um, demand money in each, each budget, and um, so we uh, one of the things we need to do is support. Minister Woods, the Minister of Research, Science and Innovation, to go in and explain to her colleagues why science, research, science and investment is a good, is a good uh, research, science and innovation investment is a good bet and can actually support um, those objectives in other portfolio, portfolios as well. But beyond that, obviously, it's about doing the right thing, right? So we all want um, our research to have you know, a positive impact in the real world, yeah. beyond academia, I guess. Um, and we want to understand how the impact actually happens. We don't really have a good handle on it at the moment. I mean, we can make some guesses. Uh, well, we think talking to potential users of research is, is probably helpful. But we, um, yeah, we don't have a good view of how that happens in practice. Um, and also, it's technically difficult measuring research impact. Um, so and it tends to you know, make people worried when we talk about it. Um, so there's a number of misconceptions which come up like how do we measure the impacts of basic research? Does this mean everything is going to have to be applied to show an impact? Um, and um, yeah, other, other things like that. So we want to really try and put some of those things, things to bed and, and um, set some clearer expectations. And have a, have a single framework so we're all working in the same way. So um, yes, as I said, we want to be able to tell this story better. Um, And this thing on the right is the Living Standards Framework. Um, so this is a, a framework which Treasury has uh, put together over the last few years. And um, so it's, it's trying to present, um, I guess, development in a, in a much broader context than traditional GDP measures. So you can see up the top there, there's all these uh, different elements of current well-being, um, things like civic engagement and government, governance, cultural art cultural identity, environment, housing, safety. So all of these um, things which go beyond the simple um, measures of income and consumption. And then at the bottom we've got these elements of uh, future well-being, the four uh, capitals as they're traditionally known. So uh, last year the government had a, its first well-being budget and there's another one you know, on the way. So um, this is really how the government is thinking about um, achieving its and we need to try and, try and show how research is contributing to that. So, um, I'll just go through a little bit of the detail. Um, one of the things the paper does is introduce this um, new definition of impact as um, change to the economy, society, or environment beyond, um, beyond contribution to knowledge and skills in research organisations. And I'll just show you this as well. So this is, it puts this in a, it's part of a results chain framework, it's what we're calling it. So you can see that definition on the right hand side. And you can see those other things. So knowledge and skills then become part of outputs, um, which is the middle box. Um, outcomes are the thing that links that knowledge and those knowledge and skills to the eventual impact. So it's things like the application of um, research um, in policy, for example. Um, or it could be um, people who have worked in, in research um, going on, moving out of academia, going and because of the knowledge and skills they've developed, um, having a positive influence on, um, on the society and on the economy in some way. So um, a lot of people look at this diagram and think, oh, it's, you know, that's far too simplistic. Um, research is actually yeah, much more complicated than that, and we agree, and we couldn't come up with a a good way of representing that complexity. So this is really just a, uh, an abstraction, I guess. It's it's a logic model which which ensures we're at least using the same terms to talk about the same thing. In reality, you know, we don't expect every research project to have all of these elements or to, to be able to show a direct impact. It might be that some some projects spend a long time 
iterating on the left hand side, picked up by other projects, you know, might have a pathway to impact might be for people, um, and, and it might not be predictable in advance. It might take decades. So yeah. Um, we think all of those those different pathways are consistent with this, um, but this shouldn't be taken as saying everything is linear and predictable. And yeah, based on the um, consultation, these are some of the introducing some principles around measuring impact, um, so acknowledging there's multiple factors involved, and not all of those will be under the control of a, a researcher or an institution. I think talking to end users is important. Um, we gather evidence, um, so the things are more than just stories. Um, we think using an appropriate unit of analysis is important. So it might be that you know for a, Something like the Marsden Fund. Um, you might look at 100 projects um, that have been funded over the last 10 years. Maybe three of those have had really breakthrough findings. And then you could look at what's happened to those in the real world. So, what we're saying is we think this can be applied to different, different types of research across different horizons, but you might have to use a different analysis to capture that the, the risk. Um, and we think uh, we want to acknowledge that you know this isn't all going to be reduced to a dollar figure. We think it's quite it's actually quite unusual that you can reduce impacts to a dollar figure and quantify and monetize them. So, um, but we want to be able to articulate impacts in a way which is just compelling for the public and for uh, decision makers and, and ministers. Um, and we want to be able to evidence that. So that would mean different things in different disciplines. And And finally, we're setting some, some expectations. Um, we're, not, we're not putting the, um, new rules around this. We want to work with the sector you know, in a joined up way because um, that's the only way this is going to work. Um, so we, all, we want everyone to start using this language from the results chain framework. And we'll start doing that ourselves, but it might take a while, a while to work its way through our, our various funded documents. Um, we want institutions to be able to articulate their contribution to research impact. And we want institutions to be helping researchers to think about that themselves. And um, we'd like to make that impact data linkable, um, which means, um, so I talked earlier about the NRIS, the NRIS database, so that's going to have all of our uh, government contracts. Um, we'd like to be able to, we know about the impact, um, we'd like to be able to link that back to some of those contracts. So that we can start to show um, the treasury, for example, look, we made this investment here and, and in these different things, and it had this contribution. And you know, you can argue about the attribution of that, but um, we need to be able to make those links. And yeah, we want to have a conversation about how much it's cost. So we understand um, measuring impact and engaging with end users takes time away from research. We think it's probably beneficial for everyone in the long term, but there are right to be resource and things associated with that. So we want to have a chat about what that might look like and um, what we might be able to achieve um, with um, some uh, specific funding for this with some sort of activities. So we'll be continuing those conversations with research officers. And yes, that's it for me. So I'll put these <coughs> up front and um, happy to continue talking about this.
The next one is something about international connections and a catalyst fund, and that's uh, quite a specific call open at the moment for linkages with China, particularly in the food science and environmental science areas. But if you are interested in linkages with China in those two areas, then we currently have a call. And as you can see, the registrations close at the end of October with applications due in December. And the last one on the slide is the announcement that was made in the budget in May 2019 about some new funding for setting up an advanced energy technology platform. This is part of our strategic science investment fund and uh, it's towards capability in these uh, areas which are important to New Zealand. So we haven't announced the details of that call yet. We're still working through what specific science areas we wanted to make that investment in and also finalising the process that we'll use. But we hope to make an announcement on that fund in a couple of months. So look out for that one um, for the end of the year. And if you're wanting to find out more information about any of our funds, a good source of 